You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, Chapter Leadership Committee member of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Jeremy. This is episode 92 of Lighthearted, scheduled for December 7th, 2020. Most Americans know December 7th as the anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii that led the United States to enter World War II. On the morning of that attack, the grounds around the Barber's Point Lighthouse were shredded by machine gun fire. The lighthouse keeper, John Sweeney, watched a dogfight between Japanese and American planes and two Japanese pilots dropped to the ground by parachute near Barber's Point. Also, on December 7, 1932, the German-born Swiss physicist Albert Einstein was granted an American visa. And on December 7, 1956, the American basketball player and coach Larry Bird was born. As a Boston Celtics fan for more than 50 years, I consider myself very lucky to have watched Larry Bird through his playing career. He once said, quote, Push yourself again and again. Don't give an inch until the final buzzer sounds, unquote. So I hear we're going to talk about lightships today. Yes, we are. We've talked about lightships a few times in this podcast. Uh, For anybody who doesn't know, a lightship is a ship that acts as a lighthouse, typically with a light or more than one light mounted on a mast. Lightships in the United States date to 1820, and reached a peak with 56 lightships in service in 1909. Lightships were stationed in many of the dangerous areas on the nation's coasts and the Great Lakes. Today's subject is the Nantucket South Shoals lightship, specifically the LV-112, which was the last vessel to serve on that station. The Nantucket South Shoals extend many miles south of Nantucket Island, which is south of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. The shoals were a great hazard to shipping, with more than 500 shipwrecks in the area. The first light ship was stationed at the Nantucket South Shoals in June of 1854. At first, lanterns were hoisted to the top of two masts on a schooner. Over the years, numerous lightships were stationed on the shoals. The lightship position was relocated several times to accommodate the shipping route. On May 15, 1934, the lightship on the station, the LV-117, was struck by the White Star Line's passenger liner, Olympic, a sister ship of the Titanic. The Olympic, about 75 times the size of the lightship, rammed into the smaller vessel in heavy fog, broadsiding it and sending it to the bottom within minutes. Seven out of the 11 crew members died in the accident. The last vessel to serve on the Nantucket South Shoals was the LV-112, built in Wilmington, Delaware in 1936. It was the largest lightship ever built in the United States. The cost of more than $300,000 was paid by the White Star Line as compensation for the 1934 collision and sinking of the LV-117. The LV-112 was built to be virtually unsinkable. Its position was 50 miles southeast of Nantucket Island and 100 miles from the U.S. mainland. By the 1970s, lightships were being phased out in the United States. The LV-112 was removed from the Nantucket South Shoals in 1975 after 39 years. After its active days, ownership of the LV-112 changed several times. In 2009, the nonprofit United States Lightship Museum, or USLM, became the new steward. The cost of the transfer was $1, but USLM founder and president Bob Menino says it's the most expensive dollar the organization has ever spent. Hull restoration and other work was soon carried out after the USLM got ownership. In recent months, the LV-112 has been in dry dock in Chelsea, Massachusetts, undergoing further restoration work at a cost of $1 million. For most of his life, Bob Menino has been involved in historic preservation and related educational programs, maritime and non-maritime, as an avocation. He is a retired marketing communications and public relations professional in partnership with his wife, Christine, 
in a communications firm that serves the medical, social, and educational community. Bob considers himself an historic preservation activist. He began his historic research and preservation endeavors by chronicling New England's historic shipwrecks and other historic maritime events. I spoke with Bob Minino in October. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking today with Bob Menino, who's the founder and president of the United States Lightship Museum, which is the steward for the Nantucket Lightship LV-112. Thanks so much for joining me today, Bob. Yes, uh, thanks, Jeremy, for uh, inviting me to, to speak with you. Let's start with a little bit of the history of the lightships on uh, the Nantucket Shoals. Can you explain a little bit of why a lightship was needed there in the first place? Yes, and actually, you know, as you know, the lightship st- service started in 1820, and Nantucket Shoals Station was actually established in 1854. Back around the mid 1800s, commerce between Europe and the United States increased uh, dramatically, and they didn't have any na- navigational aids out there. And shipping coming in to the United States and going out, there were a lot of shipwrecks occurring on the shoals. Nantucket Shoals being a series of sandbars, and they're roughly 50 miles long. And the ships coming in from Europe, were most of them were heading into New York Harbor or Boston or down south, and especially New York. The United States government at that time said because the amount of cargo and, and the value and the customs revenue was, was being lost, that they got to put a, an aid out there to help guide ships away from the shoals. So actually, originally... The uh, government, which was actually War Department, did a survey. They did a they did some research. They wanted a, originally they wanted to put a, a permanent lighthouse structure out there. It was a report by the Secretary of War. I actually have the report. The report was finished in 1852. They actually started in 1849. The final de- determination of the report was that it was going to be it was just because it was so far out. It was in deep water. The water there is close to 200 feet deep. And just a very dangerous area of navigation. You know, the uh, currents are out there. They have rotary currents are very dangerous. It's foggy a good part of the year, and uh, it was just too far out. So between that and the dangers of, of working on the lighthouse out there or building one and the expense, it decided not to, to uh, build a permanent structure. The structure that they were going to build out there was going to be a screw pile type lighthouse, which is very common down off of the um, Florida Keys. First light ship they put out there was in, in uh, 1854. It was actually LV-11. And there were wooden, as you know, there were wooden vessels, and they were roughly about 100 feet long. And the lamps on them were powered by oil, whale oil, uh, and other types of oils. First light ship, LV-11, didn't actually last that long. It only lasted several months. It was wrecked off of uh, Montauk Point on Long Island. So what they did was they decided they really needed to build a, a, a light ship and more, more or less standardize them. They uh, set out and they planned on building uh, which was called LV-1, which was Nantucket. It used to be called New South Shoals, and this would be number one. And that vessel was built actually in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It went on station in 1856, I believe. Hmm. That vessel was about 103 feet long. It was uh, built of white oak, and it was very heavily, it was constructed especially to to handle the uh, rigors of Nantucket Shoals. Now, Nantucket Shoals, right up until the, the station was discontinued in 1983, was the most remote and treacherous station in the world. And really, it was really the most famous and was the last station to be discontinued, which was in 1983. LV-1 was out there until, I think it was 1892, so it was out there for quite a few years. But uh, and, and the light ship sailors that were out there were actually stationed uh, for several months at a time because it was so treacherous in the wintertime, and this is like 365, 24-7. And a lot of the, the early lightship sailors were, were actually former um, sailors that served on whaling ships. And because they were used to being out to sea for such long periods of time, they seemed to uh, work out as the best type of men to have on the ship. Uh, after that, the I think there were a total, a total of 11 lightships uh, on the Nantucket Shoals. Nantucket LV-112, uh, of all the lightships, uh, was out there on the shoals the longest, which was 39 years. Let's skip ahead in history a little bit. I'd like to talk about the 1934 disaster when the Olympic struck the LV-117. 
uh, yep. on the Nantucket Shoals. What happened in that uh, accident? What happened was the RMS Olympic, which was the sister vessel to the uh, RMS Titanic, was coming into New York Harbor. And this was like May 15, 1934. Uh, I've heard the Nantucket Shoals is, is fog bound 40% of the year, and I've heard it over 50% of the year. Mm. But needless to say, uh, it, it was it was foggy quite uh, a lot, and uh, it would it could be fogged in for a week or two at a time. Anyways, back in 1934, it was before they had radar on ships. That what they did have is the radio beacons. The radio beacons, you know, worked very well and are very accurate. And like any buoys, you know, light ships were were navigational targets. So when a ship set its course, it set its course for that particular you know, navigational aid, which was the light ship. The only thing is, is once the light ships came into view, like anything else, they're supposed to veer off. Well, because of the fog was so thick and heavy, Olympic was, was steaming towards New York, and similar to the Titanic incident, by the time they saw the light ship, they couldn't veer off in time. And they hit the light ship broadside and, and nearly split it in half. As soon as the uh, Olympic hit the light ship, it, it, uh, it sank within minutes. There were 11 crew members on board. Seven of the 11 crew members perished. Uh, four, four of them went down with the ship, and to this day, they, their bodies have never been recovered. The, the, wreck, the wreckage is still there. There is newsreel footage of not the actual collision, but after the ship went into New York, they brought the remaining crew of the one the 117 up on the Olympic. They went into New York Harbor and they interviewed the captain of the Olympic. And the uh, the captain of the uh, 117 survived with uh, three other crew members. And there is footage of the interviews. They they panned on the bow of the uh, Olympic and you barely saw any scratches on it. I mean, it just just like a knife just split right into it. So as a result uh, of the of the deaths that occurred, the White Star Line had uh, paid uh, reparations to the families of the crew members of the 117 and also paid to have the uh, 112 built. The LV-112 was built just a couple of years after that in 1936, yeah. right? The construction started in 1935. It was built in Wilmington, Delaware, at the Pusey and Jones Shipyard. So in 1936, the uh, the 112 uh, actually went up to Boston. Boston was always the, the 112's home port. At that time, it was the United States Lighthouse Service that administered all the lighthouses and light ships. In Boston, it was the uh, second district. Today, it's Coast Guard First District. It was 1939. The U.S. Lighthouse uh, Service merged with the Coast Guard, and from 39 up to the present day, the Coast Guard uh, administers all the lighthouses. The 112, after it was built, again it was it was retired or decommissioned as a U.S. Coast Guard vessel. Now, because of the nature of the Nantucket Shoal Station, because it was so dangerous. They wanted to build a ship that was going to be, well, again, especially built for the, for the uh, treacherous conditions of the shoals. So the, the 112 is actually the largest U.S. light ship ever built. Most light ships that were built are around the more modern ones were 128, 133 feet in length, about you know 30-foot beams. And their displacement tonnage was approximately uh, 600 tons. The displacement tonnage on the 112 is over 1,000 tons, and it's uh, close to 150 feet in length. And with a 32-foot beam, has a large, you know, 16-foot draft. It has a high number of watertight compartments. It has 43 watertight compartments and has double hull, double plating on the on the bow. It was it was built like a battleship. And I think that's to this day is one of the reasons it still survives, because it was at sea for for 39 years. And like all of the light ships, the uh, 112 was uh, on station three, 365 days a year, and uh, you know 24/7, except for when it came in periodically, which was anywhere from one to two years for servicing. The light ships, uh, regardless of the weather, always stayed on station with the crews. So that's uh, why it was built so so tough so well. 
Yeah, basically built to be yeah. unsinkable. It, it really was. The other thing, too, it was built of superior quality steel. It was all United States steel. Back then, everything was made in the United States, but it was built well. It was The steel they built it with was a very high-grade steel, and as a result, it had a lower corrosion rate. It was in a very severe uh, environment, you know, salt, fog, salt air, salt water, and also the poundings of the, of the seas. And I'll just mention there were several lightships that sank in, in hurricanes and other conditions. Yes. Including the Vineyard Sound lightship that was yep. it 1944 that sank in the hurricane uh, with yep. the loss of the entire crew. So <clears throat> such things were not, not, well, they weren't common, but they did happen a number of times. Yeah, and there were and there were collisions. I mean, other collisions. Uh, four months before the Olympic had sunk the 117, the uh, the 117 had been hit by the SS Washington, which was another ship. It didn't do a terrible amount of damage, but it, it sideswiped the ship. In fact, there the crew on board. There is a quote in the publication stating that one of these days we're going to get hit and, it, and the ship's going to go down. Sure enough, there are actually photographs showing the Olympic uh, going by the 117 prior to the uh, the fatal collision, and it was a photograph taken by one of the uh, lightship crew. Remind me again, when did the LV-112 go on to the station exactly? 1936. The 112 it was built as a steam-powered vessel, and also was riveted construction. So it went on in 36, and of course, uh, two years later, in September 1938, we had the worst hurricane in New England history. That must have been interesting. The hurricane of 38, as devastating as it was, actually it kind of passed west of Nantucket Lightship. It was more or less kind of went up to the Rhode Island coast. The worst hurricane, and probably the closest the 112 ever came to, to foundering, is uh, Hurricane Edna, 1954. The 112 had actually survived 13 hurricanes during its service as a light ship. Hurricane Edna, and it was actually two hurricanes. There was uh, Hurricane Carol and Edna. Carol took place, I think it was August 31st. And um, Hurricane Edna took place on September 11th. Both hurricanes were high-velocity hurricanes. Both hurricanes produced winds of 110 miles an hour and 70-foot seas. Hurricane Edna did the most damage. In fact, it disabled the 112. The crew on the 112 thought they were going to actually going to die. There's actually radio log messages with quotes from the crew thinking, you know, they were never going to go home and they were, that was going to be it for them. What happened was the seas, uh, they were so high and so powerful, the uh, anchor chain hold, holding the light ship in place snapped, and the light ship drifted. And one of the big problems was that the uh, not being able to point the ship uh, correctly into the seas, and it was in danger of, of broaching or, or capsizing. So what happened was at the same, the same time that the anchor chain broke, powerful seas also broke through the portholes into the pilot house. It actually had uh, torn off the uh, helm station, the wheel, in the, in the wheelhouse. In fact, uh, the, the crew member that was on, his name was uh, Dick Arnold. He, he just died uh, was about a year ago. He was in Gloucester. He's one of the heroes of the, of the incident, but in addition to that happening, when, when the seas broke through the portholes, I mean, the glass in the portholes was almost an inch thick. It uh, shorted out electrical systems in the pilot house, and a lot of flooding was taking place. The uh, hull plates became buckled, and also it, uh, it damaged the lifeboats. The, uh, up in the flying bridge, the, again, that, that wheel was, was torn off, and the, actually the, uh, the compass and the binnacle was ripped right from its uh, mountings. In addition to that, you know, the light ship was still steam-powered back then, had a taller stack on it. The seas went down the stack, put out the boilers, and the ship had no power whatsoever, so it could not correct itself. They did get the engines powered up again, but when they did, they could not steer the ship. 
because the rudder, uh, the seas had damaged the rudder. The rudder was, was pushed into the hull of the ship and it was jammed and they could not steer it. I mean, everything on a light ship had backup and auxiliary systems. And there were, you know, the, the anchors, there were mushroom anchors. There were large mushroom anchors that weighed up to 7,500 pounds. The auxiliary anchors used to be kept on, a, on the decks right near the railing on the forward, so it's like the, the starboard or, or port quarter of the light ship. And they had to be lowered by a crane. The main light ship anchor went into the hull and could be deployed without any risk of it tearing into the hull. The auxiliary anchors were they were very precariously mounted, and needless to say, they changed the design. But during the st- height of the storm, which were these were 70 foot seas again, the crew had to go out on the deck of the light ship, use the crane, uh, unfasten the uh, mushroom anchor, and deploy it. And just at the right time, they had to let it go. One of the dangers was that the mushroom anchor would come back and just open the hull of the ship like a can opener. So they successfully were able to uh, deploy the anchor and uh, finally secured the ship in position and rode out the storm. And after the storm was over, the um, Coast Guard came down and they towed the uh, Nantucket back up into Boston where repairs were made. And then within a period of time, you know, the, the ship went back out on station. So it was quite a horrific event, and uh, no one there were there were injuries on board. No one no one perished, but it was like the worst incident that uh, I've seen recorded, and that I've seen former crew members talk about. I'll bet. Wow. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the other Nantucket lightships. I think people sometimes get confused because there yeah. are actually three surviving lightships that are all identified as Nantucket lightship. And I, I hear people all the time talking about, oh, I saw the Nantucket lightship. And I'll say, which, which one? And they said, oh, there's more than one. So besides its very large size, as you said, it was the largest lightship ever constructed. What are the, what are some of the things that make the uh, LV-112 unique and different from the, those other vessels that served on the station that are still around? Well, the, the 112 has no sister vessels. It, it is one of a kind. The last light ship that was constructed was the 613. That was 1952. The 612, the other Nantucket, uh, also known as Nantucket 1, uh, was constructed in 1950. Those are, in essence, they are sister vessels in terms of the hull construction. The only large difference, though, is that the 612 is constructed or set up more or less like the 112, has two masts on it, one with a rotating light beacon, the other one with a stationary light beacon. The 613 uh, probably looks or does looks more like a lighthouse a traditional lighthouse more than most of the other light ships because it has a tripod tower on it the 612 and the 613 are privately owned the 612 is actually operational and the uh, person that owns it uh, has converted it to uh, to luxury living space the outside of the light ship has pretty much been left the same it looks more more like it's uh, it was uh, when it was a, a commission light ship but the inside has been modified drastically and kind of looks like it's like a high profile hotel inside right. and uh he did that to you know charter it out for private functions mm-hmm. that particular light ship uh, was actually up in Boston Harbor for a couple of years and needless to say, he used to create a lot of confusion because people yep. would see two Nantucket light ships. He's trying to sell the light ship right now. It's right. been for sale for quite a while. Like I said, he also owns the 613. The 613, up until uh, several years ago, was down in uh, Wareham, tied up. The f- person that owned that was actually trying to find a you know nonprofit for it to you know convert it to a museum. And the uh, owner of the 612 purchased it a couple of years ago. So has uh, some thoughts of maybe converting it to a restaurant. That right now is in New Bedford Harbor and needs restoration. That's actually sitting in the it's it's bottomed out in a backwater somewhere in the New New Bedford. I would like to see that light ship uh, converted to a museum because it is so unique and it was the last light ship on station in the the United States Coast Guard. Let's move ahead a little bit more in history. Uh, How was the LV-112 used during World War II? 
In World War II, some of the light ships were converted to examination vessels. There were, I think, uh, several of them in the United States. The one, what they did is during World War II, the light ships that had the greatest amount of exposure were taken off station. They put buoys out there. The Nantucket Shoals uh, light ship being the most exposed was certainly taken off station. And what they did was in, in 1942 to 45, they converted the light ship to, uh, to an examination vessel, which was a ship that actually was uh, anchored or uh, cruised at the entrance of the major ports during World War II to inspect vessels coming in and out for enemy enemy craft. So the Nantucket was, I think they, this took place in Boston Harbor at the Navy Yard. They uh, took the lights off, painted the ship battleship gray, and they mounted two fifty caliber water-cooled machine guns on the foredeck, and they put a gun platform on the fantail. It was a three-inch fifty caliber uh, gun. And then the ship was reassigned to the entrance of Portland, Maine Harbor from 42 to 45. Now, in 1945, just a couple weeks or shortly before Germany had surrendered, the last German U-boat that came into American waters, which is the U-853, sank a Navy ship. It was the Eagle 56. And uh, many of the crew died. They sank the ship. And the 112 actually helped save crew, crew, crew members from the uh, sinking. And uh, however, the uh, German submarine escaped, went down around off of Point Judith, Rhode Island, uh, near Block Island, sank another uh, merchant vessel. And the Coast Guard and Navy finally uh, sank, tracked the submarine down and, and sank it. So to this day, the sub rests in 120 feet of water, and you know the whole crew had perished on the submarine. It's actually a dive site. I, unbeknownst to me, I used to be a wreck. I used to do a lot of wreck diving, and back in the uh, you know years ago, I used to actually dive on the uh, submarine myself. And not knowing it had any connection to the to the light ship at all. Mm. So, and then after the war was over, the uh, light ship, uh, the 112, was converted back to its uh, light ship and went back on station. I actually forgot about the light light ship connection to the uh, the Eagle 56 incident uh, that you talked about. I, I wrote a book on main shipwrecks, and I had a chapter on the Eagle 56. Oh yeah. Uh, but also, there's a, a great book on that that you're probably familiar with, uh, "Due to Enemy Action" by yes. Stephen yes. Paleo. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, some people don't realize the amount of um, shipping that the, the German submarine sank off our east coast here in the Gulf of Mexico. Yes. Quite a few ships. How many men were typically on the crew of the light ship, and what was Kind of the the daily routine, daily life like for the crew members on the 112. Well, they, it varied. Most light ships had crews of like 10 to 12 men on a light ship. The 112 had about eight, 18 crew members. There weren't rarely there were there were not 18 on the ship at one time, but they had uh, what they did is every three to four weeks they had rotated crews. A uh, lighthouse tender would come out and bring supplies and, and switch crews. Life on, on Nantucket Shoals uh, light ship was, was probably was the most isolated duty of a light ship. One of the people that served on the 112 is uh, you're probably familiar with Bernie Weber. Yes. He is from the uh, uh, Finest Hours fame. He served on it from 58 to 60, and he has a book that he wrote it's called Lighthouses, Lightships, and Lifeboat Stations. One of his most memorable uh, times in the Coast Guard was serving on the 112, and he has a lot of great stories that he tells in, in the uh, day-to-day life on, on the light ship. We have uh, several former crew members that served on the 112 that actually are volunteers. All of them have great stories. The one person who uh, is, uh, is has some really good stories uh, his name is uh, Peter Bronk, and uh, he was the uh, commanding officer of the 112, 1970-71. He actually is on our board of directors. He lives down in Portsmouth, Virginia. He's a career Coast Guard. After he uh, left the Nantucket, he served on the Atlantic strike team and was assigned to the Argo Merchant disaster, which was wrecked on Nantucket Shoals. That particular wreck was a result of the crew of the ship missing Nantucket Lightship, 
and hit the shoals. There's a good book that he's mentioned in. It's called Going Aground, and that's about that whole incident. A couple of the crew members actually uh, that were assigned to Nantucket Shoal Station were, you know, just were very fearful of it and thought they were being punished. And uh, because it was, and to some, it was like a prison ship. In fact, one of the oil, earlier Nantucket light vessels, uh, one of the crew members would say he'd rather serve his time in prison rather than hmm. serving on a Nantucket light ship. It was just such, it was pretty horrific duty because it was so isolated and the storms and the, and the, and the you know, crew members, they had stories of them getting seasick and so on, plus the noise, the foghorn, sometimes it go off a week or two weeks at a time. And those things went off like, you know, every uh, 10 to 30 seconds, and uh, and it's loud. I mean, it runs off compressed air. In fact, they're, they're so loud that uh, one time Nantucket, the 112 was in uh, port. At the, it used to go into the Coast Guard First District Station over at uh, Base Boston over near the north end. And they had to, I guess, service the foghorn. They activated the foghorn and it broke a lot of window. A lot of windows in the surrounding buildings were shattered because of the vibration, the impact of the noise. We restored the foghorn a few years ago when we activate it once a year. And I'll tell you, when that thing goes off and you're close to it, it I mean, you can feel it on your chest. Right. So the fog, so the foghorn was a was a was a real issue. When it went off, the crews had to stay below decks. In fact, many of the uh, sailors that served not just on the 112 but other light ships uh, suffer from tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears because of the foghorns. But when the foghorns went off, they had to talk in between the blasts. So it got to the point that when they went on shore leave, when they spoke to people, they spoke in broken phrases or sentences, and they had to get used to speaking normal again. Right. But that was a big factor. And then the other thing was the noise. Well, you had the diesel engines running all the time. The auxiliary, There was a, a, a generator, a diesel generator running all the time, and there was a uh, air compressor, uh, diesel air compressor running all the time. And then you had the banging of the chain. When there were rough seas, you know, you had large dialog chain that was going through the hull, the steel hull of the ship, and it was always rattling when it was rough. So when you were in a, when the ship was caught in a trough of a, of a wave, you know, slack would form in the chain. When the ship started to rise up in the wave, the, sl- the slack in the chain would snap out and create this awful banging noise and also vibrate the hull. So the men always thought the hull was going to be torn apart, and just the banging of that chain, uh, you know, incessantly going on and off, it was kind of torturous. So, in 2015, we got a grant from American Express, and that grant was to uh, rebuild. Uh, we got the auxiliary engines running, and uh, re- we serviced them, rebuilt the foghorn, and also uh, rebuilt the uh, rotating light beacon. Right. And so to celebrate that, we had, it was actually, we did it on National Lighthouse Day. We activated the foghorn and light beacon. And from that point on, we were doing it every year as kind of a celebrating National Lighthouse Day. I need to ask you, because a lot of people have heard of them, what are lightship baskets, or also sometimes referred to as Nantucket lightship baskets? Yeah, they're actually um, kind of smallish baskets. They were first started on actually LV1 back in the uh, oh, mid 1800s, and what it was because of the you know monotony of duty on on the light ships, the uh, sailors you know they had crafts, they did scrimshaw, and they made different things. And uh, while when they were on back in the home port, they used to you know, get some materials like uh, rattan and, and, and different types of uh, woods and uh, materials, and they'd bring them back to the light ship with them. And so what they did is they uh, would make made a mold, and they made these baskets. And usually they were made in, uh, oh, what were they, size? They, they weren't very big. They were something you just could carry by hand. It was like a basket you might want to put strawberries in or blueberries or whatnot, or just other types of items. And they used to make them in, in, in nest, like maybe a, a grouping of eight, and each one would nest in the other one. And so they started making them on uh, in that, on the ship. And, and what they do is when they went back on, on shore leave, they used to sell them. 
Well, what happened was the the lighthouse service at the time saw that they were kind of had started a, a cottage industry while they were employed by the government. Mm-hmm. They frowned upon it and uh, stopped them from doing it. But they uh, that was just something that was started on, on Nantucket, New South Shoals Lightship. To this day, those baskets, I mean, they, they still make them today. I mean, there are a lot of people that uh, make them in the same with the same type of uh, technique they used back then and and they're quite expensive they sell for you know several hundred to a thousand dollars a piece and they're actually made today and the uh, w- women use them as purses but also if you find some of the older ones or made by some of the light ship sailors they fetch i've seen the highest one at auction i think brought in close to one hundred and forty thousand mm. dollars on Nantucket Island, there's a great the Nantucket Lightship Basket Museum is a, is a really great place because they do the whole history. They have some of the old lightship baskets there. Let's move ahead in history here, and the ownership of the LV-112 passed through a, a few hands after it was decommissioned before it went yeah. to your organization. What are some of the ways it was used in that interim period? The... 112, because of the historic significance of it, the Coast Guard, when it was decommissioned, placed a covenant on it. And I think it's the only light ship, existing light ship, that has a covenant. And the covenant states that the 112 can only ever be used as a museum, open to the general public, and has to be preserved and maintained as it was used as a light ship, you know, in its configuration when it was decommissioned in 1975. And also, only a 501c3 nonprofit can own it, can never be sold into private hands. I think there are, to this day, the total, there are like 179 light ships built. And I think to this day, there's about, I'd say, there's oh, 14 light ships or 13 right. light ships that exist. Nine of them are museums, which includes us. For the rest of the conversation, I'm going to refer to your organization, the United States Lightship Museum, as the USLM. Can you tell me how the USLM got started and how did uh, the organization come to get ownership of the LV-112? Yeah, it was actually uh, uh, quite by accident. I mean, I've always been involved in historic preservation in one form or another and maritime preservation. In 2008, I had read an article in the Boston Globe about the uh, 112. The 112 was, uh, they were looking for a another organization to take it over. Well, it had been laid up for oh, over maybe six years down in Oyster Bay, Long Island, and the ship was in danger of being scrapped and didn't want to see anything happen to it. So we went down there, took a look at it, and she was in tough shape. What happened was the last organization that had it, they wanted to start a lighthouse museum on Staten Island. There's one there now. But when they were trying to get it going, it, it didn't happen. It fell through. And they wanted to use the 112 as sort of like a flagship. Well, so what they did was in Oyster Bay, Long Island, they have uh, like a, a festival there. And so they made arrangements to bring it over there for the festival. It was only supposed to be there, I think, for like two weeks. Well, it ended up staying there for over six years. And it was tied up to the public pier there. And, and it just kind of lingered. They had closed it. No one maintained it. It just sat there and it just was decaying. It was listing. It was full. It had all water in it. And it had like a five degree list to it. And the uh, there was nothing worked on it. It was completely, it was considered a dead ship. It was had, uh, you know, it was vandalized. It had a lot of rust on it. It just, it was, it was a mess. And we uh, had a surveyor come down and take a look at it. And uh, they, you know, determined that it was worth saving. In the covenant, I mean, uh, an organization can't take it over. Uh, it can't be transferred to an organization unless you're a 501c3. So, and also the ship had to be put into dry dock. It hadn't been in dry dock for 20 years. We had to raise the money. We had to show them we had the money and we had to start the 501c3. So because of the time constraints on it, the uh, IRS actually really moved it through. And we we, we had our... Uh, our 501c3 within uh, just a couple of weeks, actually, uh, and we raised the money. We had to raise $150,000 through private donations. In 2009, October of 2009, we made the transfer, and we purchased it. Any time the ship was to be transferred, it, it, it sold for a dollar. So we purchased the ship for a dollar. 
It was one expensive dollar, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what we did is uh, in November of that year, we knew we had a lot of work ahead of us. We had to have a trip and tow survey done and uh, per the insurance company and had to make sure everything was, you know, secure and uh, the necessary precautions taken so that, you know, we'd have a safe tow. So that took several months. And what we did was we got in touch with the United States Coast Guard Lightship Sailors Association, which are all retired lightship sailors. They're, it's national. They're all around the country. So they kind of put out the alarm. And in January of that year, lightship sailors, uh, some of which served on the 112, came out, traveled out, flew out to uh Oyster Bay in January, 10 degree weather, and we spent a whole weekend there trying to, you know, get things ready, which was a lion's share of what we had to do. I mean, like I say, it took weekends of driving down from, I live in southern New Hampshire, uh, driving down to uh, Oyster Bay, Long Island, which was like a five and a half hour drive almost every weekend with, with some other folks. And in May of 2010, we uh, hired a tow company and a tow boat company, and they came down and and uh, towed the ship up to Boston. Now, one of the, the benefits where there were a number of people from the Oyster Bay area that were really liked the ship, and they helped out. And to this day, we're, we've, we've made some close friends down there. Before we could bring it up to Boston, though, know, we had to find a, a place to keep it. So that was a little bit of a challenge. And uh, so we contacted the Port Authority and so on and some other organizations to see if we could find a berth for it. And so Massport was able to they, uh, made arrangements with the uh, shipyard there, which was the uh, Boston Harbor Shipyard Marina, and they uh, donated our berth. And we wanted to bring it, the ship to Boston because... Boston was always its home port. Came up to Boston, it's been in Boston since 2010. As soon as we brought it up there, we, we almost immediately opened it up to the public for tours, even though it was not in great shape. Luckily, one of our volunteers, and he's a former shipyard electrician, volunteered his time, is retired, and has, has virtually restored all the electrical and operating systems on the ship. When we got it, and again, nothing worked on the ship, mm -hmm. and now the ship is pretty much operational. So from 2010 up to up to this year, you know, we were we were, we opened the ship up not every day. We we had her open on Saturdays from 10 to 4 regular hours. However, we did keep the ship open for for visitors by appointment only throughout the year. And this year, because of the COVID situation and our restoration that we're doing, because the ship is dry dock right now. We haven't had any or very few visitors, and we did not open it up with regular hours this year. By the way, I mentioned to you before we started the uh, the interview here that I toured uh, the 112, and it was in Portland. I guess that would have been the late 1980s. Uh -huh. I also yep. remember seeing it at Captain's Cove Seaport and Bridgeport, right? Uh -huh. I believe that's where it was for, for yep. a while, yeah. And uh, yep. you are now, again, at the Boston Harbor Shipyard and Marina in East Boston, I know you're close to Piers Park, which is a really nice park on the waterfront there. Yes. In East Boston, yeah. There's a lot of great shipbuilding history in East Boston. And what kind of history does the Boston Harbor Shipyard and Marina have? Well, the Boston Harbor Shipyard and Marina is actually used to be the Bethlehem Steel Shipyard. During World War II, they used to service a lot of the Navy ships there. Up until the mid-'80s, they used to service a lot of large you know, commercial ships there also. The 112 used to be serviced there when it was a commissioned light ship. So we have actually photographs of the 112 in the graving dock that still exists there in, in the late 60s. And so it's very appropriate that the Nantucket is here. Not only that, I think we have one of the best views of Boston Harbor there. And the other thing, too, is the um, Boston Harbor Walk comes right to the end of the pier where we are. So we're on like two barges, which is nice because the ship kind of moves up and down with the barges. Dan Noonan, who was the uh, manager of the yard and former owner, they've sold the yard since, but he still manages the yard. But he's just been very committed to you know maritime history and, and to our cause and has been uh, really very generous in, in helping us and allowing us to uh, you know stay there. So we have a nice home there. You know, I've uh, cruised a lot over the years in Boston Harbor. It's a neat attraction from the boats, for the, from the tour boats. We, we 
probably get about, uh, with all the tour boats that go by the light ship, we probably get close to 2 million people, that visitors that see the light ship a year. And like I say, most of those tour boat lines uh, do a narration, a uh, historic yeah. narration of the light ship. Once the the restoration that's going on is all finished, do you, do you plan to resume public tours next year, hopefully? Oh, oh, mm-hmm. oh by all means. Yeah, in fact... We also encourage people, if anyone wants a tour now, we can't bring them inside the light ship, but if anyone wanted a, on a tour by appointment, we would bring them down to the shipyard and, and, and show them what's going on down there with the uh, restoration that's going on. Our mission is twofold. One is to restore and, and preserve the, the uh, Nantucket 112 and also is to operate uh, educational programs. One of the interesting aspects of the light ship was they used to uh, participate uh, with the um, oceanographic institutions on the East Coast. They participated with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. On the West Coast, they participated with Scripps Oceanographic Institution. What they did was they conducted uh, research and reporting, like uh, bottom sampling, current, that monitor the, the ocean currents and in, in marine life and so on. But they had quite a comprehensive program that they uh, did in conjunction with the uh, oceanographic uh, organizations. To this day, actually, one of the things we do is we, we bring a lot of school children youth groups like Boys and Girls Clubs and the scouting groups on on board, and we have run some educational programs, and we try to replicate some of the things that took place on the uh, during the research activity that was on board. The light ship was also a, a w- w- weather reporting uh, vessel uh, or resource for for NOAA. So again, they had a multi it was multi uh, purpose. Let's uh, move up to the present day and talk about the restoration project. It is still going on, right? Am I correct about that? Yes. Yeah. We got two grants. We got a Save America's Treasures grant from from the National Park Service, and we received a grant from the uh, City of Boston, the um, community called the Community Preservation Act. There were matching grants totaled over a million dollars. That money is allowing us to conduct the uh, restorations going on right now. The last time we, when we first got the ship, we had it in dry dock, it was in 2011, 2012. We did marine surveys of the ship. We cleaned the bottom, did UT scans, uh, checked the plating on it, and surveyed the rest of the ship to see what else had to be done in terms of restoration. Uh, surprisingly enough, because of the quality of the steel used on that ship it was so good that it still has the original plating on it. And the scans, the UT ultrasonic scans that were done on it, had uh, revealed that the you know the plating is in still is acceptable condition for what it is right now. We put the uh, ship into dry dock. Uh, it was late August of this year, and should probably be there you know, through November. There's a couple of projects that we're working on. The major, pro- it's a structural project. And what we're doing is on the forward lower lower hold, there's some floor frames in the ship there, and there are a lot of corrosion that taken place there over the years, and so we're replacing those. And it's 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 a lot of work. There's a cement ballast that was put in there, and we're having to take out cement. And uh, also there's forward ballast tanks. There were trim tanks that were uh, pretty corroded because they used to. Uh, pump salt water into them and the salt water you know just did a number on the framing and the structure inside the tank so we're rebuilding the structures inside the tanks and the uh, floor frames in the uh, in the forward lower hold among we're also cleaning the other tanks and doing another survey where the ship is riveted some of the rivets have to be repaired just doing a thorough inspection and uh, recoding the bottom we also were replacing uh, corroded steel, repairing some of the bulkheads inside uh, so we can restore the watertight integrity of the of the uh, compartment. So it's some pretty, pretty major work being done right now. Are there any other restoration projects in the pipeline after this one? Ideally, I mean, we thought we'd be done with the restoration of the ship by now, but it's all contingent on funding. You know, it's just the uh, funding hasn't come in as, as quickly as we had hoped. I mean, we've put, well, after this, we'll have put over $2 million in the restoration. And at this point, when it's what we're doing is complete, we'll have re- 
stored about 70% of the ship. The other 30%, we'll figure we will need uh, oh, close to another $2 million to, uh, to finish it up. The interior of the ship just as it hasn't been painted in years needs painting the you know the engine compartments the auxiliary engine room main engine room need to be painted and bilges clean tanks need to be you know cleaned and, and coated and so all oh, the one of the other things we did during this time around we had to take all the anchor chain out of the ship there was 26 tons of anchor chain that had to be pulled out because the anchor, the anchor lockers, the mangers that hold the chain have to be rebuilt. And so that was that was quite a job. Now we're going to paint the chain and put it back in, but uh, it was a pretty big deal. Ideally, we'd like to be able to somehow get the money. We're talking with a couple of prospects right now with hopefully we can get the money we need. And, and ideally, what we'd like to do is keep it in dry dock and, and finish it off. It's not likely to happen, but it, right now it's wishful thinking. I mean, the whole project was wishful thinking from the beginning. So, and I think <laughs> yeah. we've done, we've done, I think probably a pretty good job up to this point because we really saved a, a very famous ship. And I'd have to say it's probably the most historic light ship in the world, and one of the more historic light lighthouses, uh, floating lighthouses in the world. This ship has just it's guided some of the most famous ships in the world. The light ship was also considered and nicknamed the Statue of Liberty of the Sea because Nantucket Shoals light ship was the first U.S. landmark encountered by ships coming in from Europe. Before they came onto the American shores, they, uh, they encountered Nantucket light ship. It, it performed a really great function and it also helped save a lot of lives. And the crew members that served on it were, were real heroes too and helped save a lot of lives. So you know, it's nice to be working on a ship that help uh, help guide uh, commerce into our country and, and, and save lives. One of the other things too is that a lot of, a lot of people aren't don't know about light ships because you didn't see them for the most part. I mean, they're offshore. I mean, most light ships were you know anywhere from six miles and, and onward. Most people see lighthouses and they're 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 pretty. Uh, pretty noticeable and light ships you just didn't see them because you know they were stationed where it was impractical to build the permanent structures but you know i know that whenever as so many people do come on board they they are really fascinated the nice thing about coming on our ship is that you know especially children when they come on they can touch things you know our sound tele powered telephones work and they can talk on the phones they can steer the wheel and Climb some of the ladders and so on, and uh, we don't uh, we don't have a look don't touch type of situation. The other thing too is what we're restoring is we're restoring the light ship, so it looks like it's an active light ship and a crew lives on board. In 1960, the Nantucket light ship was refitted, and the steam engines were taken out, and then they converted it to diesel, and so the diesel engines put in. So from 1960 to 75 is the configuration of the light ship. I mean, they changed the light beacons, put more modern beacons on them. And the only outward, really noticeable sign you can see is that when the ship was built, they had a tall smokestack on it. Now it has a squattier stack on it because they put in more auxiliary engines. But other than that, the ship is pretty much the same. We just really uh, enjoy having people come on board. And the other thing, too, is we're restoring the ship to the, like, the, we've chosen, like, the late 60s time frame to uh in, in how we're setting everything up in terms of personal effect and items you have on the ship so when you walk on the ship like you'll see personal effects from the late 60s I mean you'll run into safety razors you might run into you know tape decks or we have an old television 60s TV they're going to be looping uh you know old programs on of that period so we, it's a veritable time capsule when you walk in it's going to be like walking into that time period and so that's what we're um trying to replicate now right now we even have a movie projector that was used on board there when the ship was at, on station. When a new movie came out on the mainland, they got the 16 millimeter version on the <laughs> ship. Yeah, so it was kind of interesting. Yeah. So well, that's yeah. great. You mentioned you're restoring it to the late 60s period, and what, yeah. it was decommissioned not long after that in 75. 70, 75. Yeah. 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 So let me ask you, uh, how much have you been able to make uh, contact with sailors who actually served on, on the vessel? There are several that are actually volunteers. Dick Arnold, like I say, was the last, was the, one of the earliest. We, he was on the ship in 1954. 
There's one other fellow who lives in Saugus, Mass. He was on the ship. In fact, he was on the ship right after 1954, came on when the ship was towed into uh, uh, Boston Harbor at the Coast Guard Station. He immediately was on board. In fact, when he came on board to visit, he came. He went down to the cruise quarters and he pointed to an area on the on the on the bulkhead on the wall, right near the ceiling. It says, when I came on this ship, the one thing I saw that fascinated me is I saw a footprint on the side of the wall. It goes to show you how far over the ship was uh, listing. I mean, that list that that ship during that storm, Hurricane Edna and the other hurricanes, had listed almost 60 degrees. The masts are almost touching the water, and uh, and they said that they were standing on the walls. He and then there's another fellow who served in '59, Peter Bronk, who served seventy seventy one. He's he's very active. And then there's another fellow that served on it in the late '60s and right before it was decommissioned, we have a fella. And they're all kind of relatively local in Massachusetts here. So when we do tours, uh, we have a couple of them that help with the tours. And, they, and they're great because they tell their stories of when they were on board. So we're very fortunate to uh, have some of the former crew members that are still around. So I have one final question for you for bonus points. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's been your personal favorite part of your involvement with the Nantucket Lightship LV-112? You know, just being able to uh, restore a, a famous piece of history, maritime history, and preserving it for for others to enjoy and learn from is very rewarding. The visitors, the people that come on board, when we're open to the public, we have people that come from all over the world. We've had people from Japan, Australia, England. I mean, they come from all over, all over the United States. And to see the looks on their faces and their enthusiasm, it's it's infectious. You meet a lot of really nice people. That That's a very rewarding part of doing this project and see, is really seeing the people, how, how pleased they are and, and how much fun they have coming on the ship. And it's, for them, it's a unique experience. But then the kids, the kids really get a big kick out of it. It's just interesting just to um, be talking to everybody. And once again, it's it just uh, to be restoring and being instrumental and help uh, save a, an American icon is, is very gratifying. And one thing I didn't mention is the uh, another organization that's been very instrumental in helping us is the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Mm. They've been very instrumental in helping us uh, gain funding. And they also, they actually partnered with us back in 2011, 2012. They started their Save America's Treasures program. And we were the, one of the first. They picked 25 historic sites in the United States to uh, start their program with. And so we were chosen in their, uh, at the beginning of their program. We've been designated a national treasure by the trust. I just really want to congratulate you on the current work that will soon be finished. It's uh, so great uh, that you've been able to have that done. And I applaud you for everything you and your organization have done uh, since getting ownership of the LV-112. And I, I applaud you and thank you for, on behalf of the public, you know, for, for what you've done to save that, that incredible vessel and its history and to open it for the public. And I want to thank you for spending this time with me today. And I can't sure. wait to, you know, I've been on the vessel in the distant past, but I can't wait to be on the, the restored version of it. Bob Menino of the United States Lightship Museum, thanks again so much for spending this time with me today. Yeah, and I'd just like to say one other thing is that this whole program and the restoration we're doing couldn't be done if it wasn't for all our volunteers and our contributors, financial contributors. But the volunteers, it's truly a team effort. And it just couldn't be done without the dedication and commitment by everybody that has helped us out and continues to help us out. I mean, to say we have volunteers that have been with us from the very beginning and have stuck by us. And uh, and we really appreciate that because it's uh, without the the commitment of everybody, we, we couldn't do it. And uh, so we're very, very thankful, and I, uh, I want to applaud you for all your work and what you've done and, and uh, to research and help share uh, all your knowledge with others and help educate and uh, inspire other people. History is uh, it's just it's just it's fun. It's like you know the more you dig into it, the uh, you know it's like digging for finding buried treasure. You know it's uh, it's just it's just a lot of fun, and and it's it's nice to be able to help teach people and have see people learn from it. 
Well, thank you for the, the kind words. And, uh, you know, light ships don't always get the attention they deserve. You know, I've done a, a few shows, a few of these podcast episodes on light ships, and I hope to talk to you again in the future. You're obviously so knowledgeable <laughs> on this subject. Thank you again, Bob Menino. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and please come and visit us anytime you want to take a tour. Just Just give us a holler. Thanks, as always, to all the staff, volunteers, and members of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Check out the website at uslhs.org to find out about all the things the Society has to offer. Donations to the U.S. Lighthouse Society make this podcast possible, along with other lighthouse-related education and preservation projects. If you listen to this podcast through Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. Thanks for co-hosting today, Cindy. My pleasure. And to everyone, as always, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light. I'm gonna let it shine.